At Amish Tea, we always like to stay connected to our ingredients and the communities that produce them. So earlier this year, I traveled to Tamil Nadu in India to visit the Kora Kunda Tea Garden, 6,400 feet above sea level. shipped off to the processing center. Two-thirds of the land is still rainforest, which helps explain why there's so much biodiversity. The landscapes in Korakunda are amazing, but the most cherished asset in the community is the school that's supported by fair trade funds. In fact, the school is so impressive that families from surrounding communities try to get their children into the school, even if the parents don't work in the tea garden. We were warmly welcomed and even treated to a local version of the Hokey Pokey. Just for fun, I brought along salt rockets, a toy my sons and I have always enjoyed, and we even managed to get one stuck on the roof. We also visited Bengaluru to learn more about the Tulsi plant. The first farm we visited was four acres owned by a farmer and his wife. The power only comes on for three hours a day in Bengaluru, and it just so happened that when we were there, the power came on. So when the water pump started, it was time to plant the Tulsi seedlings. It took a few tries to learn how to plant the seedlings the right way. Cows grow freely in India, so you have to watch your step. Tulsi is also known as holy basil, and the herb is used in Hindu ceremonies, as seen here with this Tulsi garden. During the visit, our supplier and I cut the ribbon on a new Tulsi drying facility. The farmers can sell freshly picked Tulsi for about 14 cents a kilo. Not that much. When they sell it as garlands, they can sell it for 36 cents a kilo. But when they can sell Tulsi as a dried ingredient, they can sell it for $3.70 a kilo. The new drying shed allows the community to capture more than 20 times the value of freshly picked Tulsi. I also met with several dozen local farmers. Well, At Amish Tea, we always like to... If you get the picture there, I'm not going to try to show it again. Um, but, uh, so, you know, you can see the impact on the community when you can um, transform their economic, really, from 14 cents a kilo to $2 or $3.70 a kilo. Dramatic difference. And it's really just about having them get the value added. Uh, and so for this community, not a school, but a, a drying shed, which as you can see is a very basic structure really can play that kind of role in the community. And one of the nice postscripts to the video is that uh, when I visited their capacity, the community's capacity was 10,000 kilos of Tulsi a year, and I just saw the supplier um, just last, last month. They're now up to 100,000 kilos. Because it's a real economic, it's a material difference, right? All of a sudden, it's actually a livelihood you can, can make. So um, it's really exciting to feel that that investment um, is, is already paying off in terms of the better supply chain. Okay, so we've been to uh, the White House, we've been to India. <laughs> Where did it all start? So, 16 years ago, uh, when I was thinking about what I wanted to do next, I was working at Calvert Funds, I was enjoying it, um, a mutual fund company that does socially responsible investing, but I always kind of had that entrepreneurial edge. I felt like I wanted to create something. And so if you had told me that I'd be running an enterprise that's helping to eliminate billions of calories from the American diet, and helping to support the growth of organic agriculture, and helping to spread fair trade labor standards in the developing world. I was like, that sounds perfect. What's the nonprofit I'm running here? Or what's the government entity that I'm involved with? I would never have guessed that it was a beverage company, let alone one that's now part of the Coca-Cola company, or let alone one that delivered a 26-fold return to its original investors. Um, so it's been quite an unusual journey for me, building Honest Tea, and one that I, you know, continues to be full of surprises and, and still um, real, um, measurable, uh, not just satisfaction, but creativity and challenge. So it started with, uh, in the classroom, and this is, uh, as you all now know, we have a, a comic book that we put out to tell our story, um, and it, it is, um, this is one of the early scenes from the, the Yale School of Management where Barry, my professor in the top left, um, was giving a course on competitive strategy on the beverage industry. And we talked about the dynamics, what's missing, you know, there's all these products in the market, and there were literally hundreds of products. 
but they were kind of all the same. They all had the same sweetness profile, they all had most of the same ingredients, and so what I said, what was missing was the different sweetness levels. There weren't, that's supposed to be me over there. Uh, um, they, so why not have a product? You know, when I make iced tea at home, I don't put 10 teaspoons in per serving. Maybe I put one or nine. Why wasn't there a drink like that? And so that was really where honesty kind of got its start. Um, I had reached out to, um, at, so after school, I, I was working for Calgary. I went for a run in Central Park. And I felt like there was still nothing in the cooler that it was going to satisfy me. So I reached out to Barry, and Barry had two great insights that kind of helped it come together. The first was he had been to India, he had studied the tea industry, and he had seen that uh, the tea that is used to make bottled tea in the United States was kind of the, the lowest quality tea. It was really the dregs left after all the everyone had bought everything else. So you can make a much higher quality tea with real tea leaves and still only be spending a few pennies per bottle. The other insight he had come up with was the name, honest tea which for me was kind of like the clouds partying and, oh yeah, I get it, it all makes sense. And one funny postscript to uh, that was when we registered the name, we filed the trademark as both, we said honest tea, the two words, but we also registered it as H-O-N-E-S-T-E-A. And within a few weeks of submitting the application, we heard back from Nestie's trademark attorney who said, you're trying to market ho Nest <laughs> Said if we withdraw the application for home ST, will you let us keep on ST? And they did, so that was how we got the name. And so um, I, I left my job at Calvert. I uh, set up in my house. I, I, I mentioned in the book that the, the most significant event, you know, the first week was that I deleted the solitaire program on my computer. <laughs> and then started uh, writing a business plan. Within a few weeks, I got an appointment at Whole Foods, the local Rockville office. And I went there with five thermoses of tea that we buried and I brewed in my kitchen, and an empty Snapple bottle that we pasted the label on, and we presented it to the buyer and said, I want to sell this in your stores. And the buyer looked at it, and he understood why it was different. He said, yeah, we'll take 15,000 bottles. And there was this awkward pause, because we never made it any more than in our kitchen. <laughs> I said, great, right, great, right, that's just fine. I was hoping to hear it. Why don't you give me three bottles, and we'll deliver it. And so we scrambled, and literally travel up and down the East Coast to find bottling plants, and we ended up finding a plant. I'll talk a bit more about how we did that. And we made the delivery, and that first summer, all we did was sample. In fact, we had a great University of Maryland a Smith graduate, who was our, one of our first, our first intern. Uh, but that was a little awkward, too, because she came to, for the interview in my house, in the guest room of my house. So, uh, <laughs> this is a real business. <laughs> So we all we did all that first summer, those interns and I gave out samples of tea. And we gave out many more samples than we sold. But we sold the just to we sold it. And we still became the best selling tea in the whole food store. So we can guess how many we gave out, we did a lot. Um, and from there we kind of grew beyond to the rest of the whole food stores and, and beyond that to the rest of the natural foods uh, world. And became the best selling tea there. But I want to talk a bit about um, the whole entrepreneurial process because part of being an entrepreneur is you have to be able to make um, decisions with limited information. That's really one of the big differences. You know, a company like I see now, Coca-Cola, can spend years uh, and millions of dollars gathering information to make a decision. When you're an entrepreneur, you can't. You have to go with your gut. And so I want to do a quick exercise with you all. Um, and it really is based on this idea. So I remember there were so many times in the business, I would talk to Barry and he'd say, well, we've got to go find a chai recipe. And I, you know, I, I didn't, know anything about how to make a chai recipe. How do we can make a chai recipe? He said, well, what's so complicated? Just go to a spice house in Baltimore and you know, put to, get, we know the ingredients, you just have to sort of keep mixing them until it tastes good. Uh, <laughs> he's actually right. So uh, one of the things that you know, you'll see, I talk a lot about our ball pack quotes, and this is one of my favorites. So knowledge is the process of piling up facts. Wisdom lies in their simplification. So right now, you're in college or business school or graduate school, and you are piling up tons of facts of information. And the wisdom comes when you sort of understand how to apply them. And you can sort of filter out, do I really need to know when you're this treaty was signed? Probably not in the long term, but I have to understand the relevance of it, or how to apply it, how do I sort of take my knowledge and make it useful. So we're going to do a very quick exercise, which is how it has to be with an entrepreneur. I have um, <laughs> two different shirts I'm going to be giving away for whoever gets the closest answer. 
We're going to reward, um, the, well, I'll tell you in a sec. So what I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to give you about 15 seconds, which is plenty of time to answer this question. And then um, I'll ask for answers, we'll, and then we'll figure out the answer together. Okay, so you see here, honest tea, honey green tea. It's the best selling tea in our line. It's the best selling organic bottle tea in the country. My question is simple. How much does it cost to make a bottle? Now don't yell it out, think about it. Like I said, you have 15 seconds starting right now. Is it the product or the actual <laughs> To make the product, to make the product. Hey, you see picture. Six more seconds. <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to do, I always like to reward um, people in the front row for, for taking that. So I'm going to take, they're going to take four guesses from the front row. So what, 30 cents. 65. 14. 14. Okay, so we got 30, 65, 14, and is it 7 or 7? Seven? 7. Okay. So it seems like a pretty complicated question, right? But what you do is you just break it down into its smallest parts. So literally, what are the parts of this product that we have to um, buy? What do we have to in order to make the product? So if someone tell me what do we have to pay for to make this product? The label. The label. Okay. So how much? Now let's assume for this that we're making uh, about uh, twenty million of these. How many? How much do you think the label costs per? Per bottle. <laughs> Three. Label's one cent. And I'm rounding here. It's technically 1.1 cents, but those, those tens of pennies make any difference when you're selling 20 million. But okay. Uh, what else do we have to pay for? The bottle. The bottle. <coughs> the bottle. How much? How much? How much? How much? How much? How much? How much does one bottle cost? So it's about 10 cents. When we were buying it before we were buying it, when we were buying it without Coca Cola, it cost us about 14 cents. Um, but we'll say it costs 10 cents now because we're buying a volume. Okay, what else? Tea. tea, thank you. All right, now before you tell me how much the tea costs, keep in mind we're talking about organic, fair trade tea. Um, it's, it, and it's not dragged and just fashion, it's easily within sort of the 10% of the best tea in the world. How much do you think it costs per bottle for tea? 15. Four. Four cents. <laughs> now, the irony there is that um, our, we spend four times what other companies spend on tea. But it's, a, it's an affordable luxury. It's still only four cents. Okay, what else are we, what else are we paying for? Cap. <coughs> How much does a cap cost? It's about two cents. What else? Honey. So, the water is part of the bigger thing. There's water, um, it's the production, it's the equipment, the labor, all of that comes under what we call a copac fee. So we paid one price for all of those things. We're going to call it the copac fee. How much do you think the copac fee is per bottle? I'm about to know 11 cents. Okay, what else? Honey. Honey, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to combine because it also has organic um, sugar. So organic, now before you tell me how much it costs, keep in mind, organic honey, the rules are really strict because organic means it can't be grown with any chemical pesticides or any chemical fertilizers. And so with bees, you're talking about a moving target, right? The rule is that the apiary, that's where they keep the bees, can't be within two miles of any pollution source. So if there's a golf course, you know, a mile away, the apiary loses its organic status because they're using pesticides on the night green. Um, so for us, we have to source all of our honey internationally. There's no U.S. domestic source of organic honey. How much per bottle is our organic honey and sugar? Tell us about four cents. So the thing is, we're spending tons more on our sweetener, but we're using one third of the sweetener that the other brands use. So actually, it's, our costs are about the same. Because we're using it's a lot less calories, right? OK, we want anything out? Overhead. Say it again? Overhead from marketing. Overhead, we're not going to count that in the cost of goods. So, but we do have a few other things. First of all, there's the case tray. It comes in a case, you have to count that. Tray, that's about a penny. And then there's what we're going to call freight. Freight warehouse. And that actually is pretty expensive because you're talking about moving around liquid. 
that comes out to about six cents a bottle. There's another one called shrinkage. We'll put down, we'll put here shrinkage, and that's going to be another penny. So this will be uh, here. Okay. Here we go. 17, 21, 23, 34, 38, 40 cents. So it looks like our winners, certainly the 30 cents. <laughs> this one's 26, this one's 25. So our 30 and 65 guessers, can you remind me which ones you are? <laughs> Uh, I'm going to play for you a voicemail that one of our 
um, sales reps received from, uh, from one of our, from our New York distributor. And I'm just giving you a feel for the, the flavor of, of, of these guys. And it's a little coarse, but it's for educational purposes. <laughs> Yo, this is what we want to distribute this. Look, all the things that can f up, if you don't be able to f your f that works for you, well, you can take your f on the feet and stick up their camera or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, f you, f you on the feet. Oh, you get the idea. The point is, it's tough to deal with these guys. And, you know, I think it's very easy in a management community to say, and have this virtuous um, supply chain. You start with a fair trade tea garden, and you end up with a natural foods consumer, and everyone's seeing kumbaya all the way through. <laughs> but the fact is, you, you need to build, you, in order for the business to, to, to be effective, you need Louie to feel like there's something in it for him. And as you might guess, he's not motivated by the fair trade school. He's like, <laughs> so you need to have a business proposition that works. Um, on just the, the business side of it. And so for him, that was a chance, you know, could he make money on the product? And as you could hear, he was fairly passionate about the business, which meant, actually it's a good thing that he felt like this was a business and he wanted to protect it. So anyway, we started, started working with those kinds of distributors and we were starting to get some scale. We got distributors in the mid-Atlantic here, we got distributors on the West Coast, up in Boston, and we were growing. But we also ran into some limits because we were um, being approached by national chains like Safeway that wanted our product, and, and we'd say, oh, that's great, you know, we can bring it to your stores in California, and they'd say, well, what about our stores in Chicago? What about our stores in Texas? And we didn't have an answer. So we realized we really needed a national partner to help us scale the business. And so in 2007, we started getting approached by lots of different um, beverage, food beverage companies. And we ended up um, choosing to be, to be Coca-Cola. Um, and this was, the, um, this was the, the slide that they showed to their board when they made the recommendation to invest in honesty. You'll see a lot of themes here that will resonate with the net impact uh, community. So in 2007, there's three big megatrends. These aren't just bad. These are real directions our society is headed. And so health and wellness, environmental consciousness, and social responsibility, these are all directions that our society is headed with will be increasingly important. And the area where they overlap, this little white triangle and nexus is is critical. And although it's small in 2007, if you look five years out or six years out, the standard of doing business will be that every business will be expected to operate with a mindset that addresses all of those priorities and really takes them into account and, and prioritizes them. And their contention was that honest tea is there. That's what honest tea is. An investment in honest tea is an investment in that approach to doing business. And so for us, that was, we got it. We knew we needed distribution help. And we knew that we wanted a partner who could sort of see the big picture. It wasn't just a tea brand, it wasn't just an organic brand, it wasn't just a fair trade brand, it wasn't just a low calorie brand. It was an investment really in doing business to <coughs> So Coke invested 40% of the company, uh, they bought 40% of the company in 2008 and came on as the minority shareholder and we started to scale the business. And so now I'm going to tell you a bit about how we took this small mission driven business and scaled it. But before I do, let's remember. You got an organic fair trade brand, started at my house, partnering with a huge multinational. Um, does anyone have a guess? How many servings of Coca Cola products are sold every day? Just a guess. <laughs> 1.7 billion. So it's a big company, it's a global company. And so what does it mean when we're partnering with a company like that? Well, it means we're moving into what we call the shades of gray, right? We gotta, and so what is that, what are the implications? Well, when I was growing up, I grew up in um, the 1970s, and um, my parents were both professors, and they were one specialized in Russia, one specialized in China, so we were kind of, the Cold War was all around us. And during the Cold War, everything was pretty clear cut. There were the capitalists and the communists, so you sort of knew who the good guys and the bad guys were. And, and then there was Made in the USA, that was always seen as a good thing. And then you had Made in Japan, which was seen as not as a good thing, because you know, it wasn't playing US jobs. And then, today, if you look, you've got Made in the USA by a Japanese company with parts of Central and Mexico. <laughs> That's a lot more complicated, right? It's not clear exactly, well, is that good, is that bad? Um, and then you think about it, locally grown organic. We can all agree that's a very positive thing to support. But then you've got the factory farm, that's the one I think you don't want to stay away from. Today you've got organic asparagus that's sold in Whole Foods that's been airshipped from a large scale farm in Chile. Well, it's organic, so that's good, right? But it's shipped on an airplane, that can't be good for the environment. 
Um, so there's just a lot more gray out there. So how do you navigate it? For us, it really comes down to the fact that we've got a, a company with a commitment to sustainability. Sustain means to nourish and uphold. That operates in a consumer economy. Consume means to devour and destroy. So we're in that gray space. And so we're a mission-driven business operating in a consumer economy. Every business, if they're being honest, operates in this contradiction. And so for what we say, I say, there's no such thing as a socially responsible business. There's a business that's on a journey trying to get there. But if you're really being honest with yourself, you're never going to get there because if you're being honest, you have to recognize that you can do more and then you need to do more. So every year we put out a mission report. That's a picture here. Our, our, our mission report's coming out, I think, just next week. Um, that is, we call it keeping it honest. And it, we, tr we show sort of what we're doing and we talk about it with quantitative metrics. And, and it's not a cheerleading document. It shouldn't be. It's really sort of a chance to say, here's what we can do better. <laughs> and part of it is, the more honest you can be, the less likely someone's going to attack you. It's like my friend, Barry, the very creative guy. He has um, very colorful socks. And so I said, why, why, why do you wear such colorful socks? He says, look, people are going to make fun of you no matter what. Keep, better keep their attention on your ankles. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, not that um, you know, we're asking to be made fun of. The point is, let's, let's say all the bad things about our company we can and be honest about it. And so where we can say something that we know is, is true, let's make sure it's a third party that's verifying it. So organic and fair trade and even FDA claims, all are third party verified. All right, so how do we take the business to scale? What is it that? Well, when Coke invested in 2008, Honesty was available in 15,000 stores. Today, Honesty is in over 100,000 stores. So we really helped scale the distribution. And we talk about democratizing mechanics. We started the business to change the diet. Now we have a chance to do that. What about on the production side? Well, this was a true scene from the book that uh, I was preparing before I went to give in my uh, Resignation, Cal, but I called her and said, are you sure you're going to make this much tea? He said, well, how hard can it be? You know, he's dipping a tea bag. You just take this and multiply it times 10,000. <laughs> so we learned it was a little complicated. And so for us, we did have to have these bags and we were dumping in the tank, but the, the tanks would clog, the pipes, um, the, the, the bags would break, and we end up with, you know, tea leaves everywhere. And in the bottle, we get like an inch and a half of, of the sediment. And so this is a picture from our early production runs, you can see these bags here. And so uh, on a good day, we can make about 18,000 bottles and um, get about, as I said, about an inch and a half of sediment. Then we evolved to this system. This is a tea basket. And this got uh, sort of about a half inch of sediment. Some people say, am I supposed to chew that? No, it's just that, you know, uh, <laughs> we're trying to filter that out. And, and we can make about um, 60,000 bottles a day. So we're getting better. But of course, you're talking about Coca-Cola, you really need to have scale in your production. And so what some people said at the time, well, Coke's going to try to find a shortcut. They're going to try to make a powder or a syrup that you know, concentrate so they can just you know, run it through their, their line. But instead, we set up these two different tea brewing systems. This is our um, system in Northampton. That's me on the third floor. And then this is our system in California. Each of these can make 500,000 bottles a day. And the tea is much better clarity and consistency than it ever was back in the uh, early days. So that's how we scale production. What about um, innovation? Well, this is a true story. So my, I have three sons. And uh, in about 2006, I was making, I'm, I'm the lunch maker at home, which is not a very technical thing for me because it's just putting stuff in a lunch box. But I was making lunch for my son. And my middle son says, Daddy, I know you sell healthy drinks to grown-ups, but how come you put really sugary drinks in my lunch? And I had a Capri Sun. And I looked at it, and it was 100 calories per 6.75 ounce of pouch which is more calories per ounce than in the can of soda. Mm. And that's what it's probably a lot of you grew up on. Uh, and I realized it was a great opportunity to make a product to take the same honest brand and put it in a pouch. So we thought, when we, we started business, we thought we were honest tea and everything was tea, tea bags and the bottom of it. Actually, the word honest is a much bigger idea than just tea. And so for us, we launched this line, Honest Kids. And initially, we brought it out with um, sweet and only with organic cane sugar. 40 calories a pouch. So that's a good innovation. But uh, working with Coca-Cola, this year we launched the product and we sweetened it only with fruit juice. So nutritionally it's the same, right? 40 calories is 40 calories. But if you think about the optics, if you're a shopper, in this case a parent, buying a, a box, a product, and you look at the ingredients, instead of seeing sugar as the first ingredient, you're now seeing organic fruit juice or organic grape juice. Um, 
much different proposition and the line has just exploded. In order to do this, we actually had to buy more than half of the world's supply of organic OU kosher white grape juice. And so we literally had to send rabbis to Turkey and to Argentina. <laughs> and I think that was, just today we were going over our, um, our, our payment for consultants. And I, um, I said, gosh, why is our consultants so high? I said, well, this was the rabbis. It was like $200,000. What were they, you know, where did we put them off? But, <laughs> It worked out. Uh, and the line is really grown. And this is an example of the kind of, not just the innovation, but the, the scale of partnering with Coca-Cola uh, that we were able to, to help make happen. All right, so that's how our innovation works. We also have brought out larger bottles, um, uh, a line called Honest Fizz, which is a zero calorie, uh, naturally sweetened soda, and then a Honest Fresh Food line we we're selling in restaurant chains. And we've actually had two uh, major restaurant chains that are, that are looking at this to, to expand. So that's how we've taken our innovation to scale, but what about um, all the rest of our innovations? This is our growth curve. You can see all of our innovations, not all, but a lot of them have really been driven by our mission, whether it's you know, organic, fair trade, uh, lightweight packaging, different uh, approaches to health, and we'll do over 110 million in sales this year. Uh, and then we've also had our share of products. We had a tea bag line that didn't work. We had a product called Coconova. Anyone try that one? What? I like that. <laughs> Not many, though. And that was why it didn't work. Um, <laughs> my, my son uh, did some summer sampling reports, and uh, he was in a whole food store. He was giving out honest Coconova. And someone said, do you like this product? He's like, honestly? <laughs> <laughs> that was my own son, so it did not work out for that one. Um, so we're certainly, you know, for us, we have to be willing to fail. We have to be, you know, keep on innovating and keep trying. Eventually, we get some, some nice successes. Uh, all right, so that's how our innovation has been continuing. But what about the marketing? Well, these are some scenes from our first summer of sales, and that's, where, that's supposed to be our, our mayor. We had a Maryland intern and a Georgetown intern that we were giving out samples. And as some of the folks in this audience know, Bill and Erica, we've done, continue to do sampling as our primary way of building our brand. <laughs> And so how does it change though when we go to scale, right? It's one thing if you can be, when you're only in 17 stores, you can literally be in every store giving out product. And I was in every store and I did give out product. When you go to 100,000 stores, you can't get to every store. So how do you reach people? How do you create awareness in a, at scale? And so um, we found some other ways to do it. There's no um, better single impression than you can just so, stare someone face to face and give them a product. But when you can't do that, you have to find other ways. And for us, we've always felt and paid advertising is paid advertising. I mean, it's not necessarily as authentic or as trusty, trustworthy. So we do some different things. Um, for the past five years, we conducted a social experiment where we put out racks of tea, like you see here, and we put up a sign that says it's a dollar a bottle, it's the honor system. And then we put a loose side box where people can put their money, and then we step back and we watch what happens. And I'm going to show you what happens, but before I show you the results, any guesses, for those of you who don't know, uh, any guesses how honest do you think people are? What percent of people put money in the box? How honest are people out there? 60, 80. All right, so I'm going to show you the uh, video that shows you the results. But before I do, just keep in mind, think about this also as a marketing investment. Pay attention to the experiment, but also pay attention to it as a marketing investment. Just how honest are you in public if no one has their eyes on you, or at least you think they don't? America's honest data has been put to the test using data gathered from experiments conducted in all 50 states. The company behind Honest Tea set up an unmanned kiosk all across the states. Those kiosks offer drinks for a dollar on the honor system. All while secretly recorded. So they said they were extra honest. 
There's a beauty in the honor system when it works. It really is. The District of Columbia. They <laughs> were Different direction. 
because they're really invested in the direction that we're in. And so what happens, what it takes is entrepreneurs who can come in with a different idea about how to live, how to build a society. And, when the, and it's not just the idea, it has to work. So when it, you know, if IST had been sort of a, a niche product that kind of was selling well in natural food stores but didn't cross over, that's not interesting to Coca-Cola. There's a lot of brands like that. When we did, uh, demonstrated the ability to cross over and be where the consumer is headed, then all of a sudden, wow, this could be a really good investment, and it will be a change in the way that company interacts with its consumers and with the environment. And that can happen all over our economy, but it starts with the entrepreneur. And as the book makes clear, it's not easy work. There are all along the way, there's so many people who said this couldn't be done, and I'll just close with this quote, which is on the wall of our office in Bethesda. Those who say it cannot be done should not have the people doing it. So I hope you'll all join me in doing it because our society needs it. Thank you very much.